Hi, I'm Norm Abram. Welcome to the New Yankee Workshop. In our continuing series of programs dedicated to the use of a single tool, today we're going to talk about the table saw. In program one of two programs, we'll talk about the options when selecting a table saw, the features that are important, how to maintain and adjust your table saw, and we'll make some fixtures that'll make your table saw more versatile and safer. That's next, right here in the New Yankee Workshop. The options available to woodworkers when it comes to table saws is impressive. I remember my father's first table saw. It was a circular saw mounted in the underside of a milk crate and we would use it to cut flooring on the job site. Now he would recognize one of these. This is a bench top saw. I borrowed this one from Tom Silver from this old house. I think he has a dozen of these all over his job sites. They come in handy and contractors love them because they're light, they take a lot of abuse, and the tops are generally made out of cast aluminum so they won't rust if they get exposed to a little bit of weather. Now these are known as direct drive saws because the blade is attached directly to the motor. There are no belts. The rip fences over the years have improved. It has the ability to tilt the blade which by the way is 10 inch which is pretty much the standard of the industry these days for table saws. And this is great if you're doing exterior trim or ripping some two-by stock. But I wouldn't want to use one of these to build fine furniture. However, if you're looking for your first table saw, this is a good bargain. The price is right. The next option is a step up of price and performance. This is known as a contractor's saw. We've had this one around for years over in the garage workshop. In fact, it's been neglected a bit. There's some rust on the cast iron table. Now we start to have some compromises. We're getting into a saw that's a bit heavier. It's not going to be as easy to move around. However, with this cast iron top, the manufacturer can machine this absolutely flat, and these miter slots can be very accurate. The extensions are pressed steel, and that's a trade-off. You don't want to make this saw too heavy, but I want some support for larger pieces. The fence rail is aluminum, again, for weight, as well as the fence itself which is actually dramatically improved over the bench top. We have a little more power here. It's one and a half horse, 120 volts, and this motor can be removed to also take away weight if you want to move the saw. It unplugs and it comes off this bracket easily. It's a V-drive single belt, not a direct drive. We have a 10-inch blade, and this one does have an advantage over the bench top saw in that the arbor is long enough to accept a full stack dado set. There are a lot of improvements here, and with a saw like this, you can begin to think about building some fine woodworking projects. That's the good news. The bad news is they don't make this saw anymore. But don't overlook the used table saw market. If you happen to find one that's in good condition, you can make a deal. Here's the latest version of the contractor's saw, and there are some nice improvements. It's getting a bit heavier, however. The extensions are now cast iron instead of the punched steel. They're a couple inches wider than the steel extensions, but I like that because now I have a big cast iron surface that's absolutely flat and plenty of room to handle larger pieces. The rip fence is improved. The rail is tube steel. It's going to stay absolutely straight, and it's attached to the saw with a nice rugged angle iron. The fence slides nicely on the rail. It's more rugged, and it locks in place very firmly. Now with all that additional weight, the manufacturer has incorporated the mobile base. It's part of the tool. Makes it easy to move it around in the shop. And when I get it where I want it, pop it up and all four legs are firmly planted on the ground. However, if I had to move this to another building, I don't know, it might take four people to lift it up into a pickup truck. The horsepower is one and a half, the same as the earlier version, as well as the dust collection. Now with a saw like this, you can really begin to think about building some fine furniture. Meet the hybrid saw. This is halfway between the contractor's saw and a premium cabinet saw. It has a cast iron table, just like the contractor's saw, and a similar fence system. Where the differences start are in the motor. Now we have one and three quarter horsepower, so a little more power. And the base is different. Rather than being on legs, we have an enclosed cabinet that houses the motor. And because it's sealed, it has much better dust collection. There's also a nice safety feature on this one. It's the switch itself. 
you have to be very deliberate when you turn it on. And to turn it off, it's only necessary to hit this big paddle. So if you can afford to give up mobility in your shop, and you're not willing to pay the price for a premium cabinet saw, this might be a great place to start. In my view, this is the ultimate cabinet saw for a serious woodworking shop. In fact, you see saws like this in just about every commercial shop there is. They buy them because they work well. Now this one came to the shop 12 years ago and it performs today as well as it did when we installed it. A little maintenance on the top is about all we ever do. The crank mechanisms are very smooth and when you use this saw and crank the blade up and down, it's sort of like test driving a luxury car. It just works beautifully. It has a three horsepower motor with 220 volts, which means it comes up to speed instantly and it doesn't bog down even with the toughest piece of hardwood going through the blade. Now if you have the room and the budget, this is the saw that I would recommend for a serious woodworking shop. Let's talk about saw blades. I can only make accurate cuts if I have an accurately set up table saw and a good sharp blade. Now if all I were going to do were cross cuts on this saw, I would choose a blade like this, an 80 tooth cross cut blade. But I'm going to be ripping as well. So what I want and like to use is a combination blade. This is a 40 tooth blade and it's ground in such a way that it can rip as well as it can cross cut. A blade is made up of a piece of steel, fairly thick and nice and flat. It's cut out and these little carbide tips are welded to the ends and then they're ground to the right angle. Now these carbide tips are very fragile, so I don't want to put metal to metal. They could break off and chip. And sometimes they chip just from use, but that doesn't mean I'm going to throw the blade away. I can bring it to a shop, they can weld on a new tip, and re-grind it. Even with normal use, this blade will eventually get dull. And a sign of dullness is burning wood, or difficulty trying to push a piece through when you're ripping. So then we want to sharpen it. Some manufacturers will take the blade back and sharpen it for you. That's ideal because they're going to grind it to the same angle. If you can't send it to the manufacturer, I bring it to my local shop where the pros go because they're very fussy about how their blades are sharpened. You never throw these away. They're too expensive. Let's talk about inserts. That's the red piece right here in the middle of the table. This is the one that came with the saw. It has four leveling screws and I can use an Allen wrench to crank it up and down until it's absolutely flat or even with the top of the table surface and that's very important because I don't want the wood tipping in. The slot around the blade is pretty wide and that's deliberate because without having it that wide I would not be able to tip the blade to 45 degrees without it binding. Now that's fine for bevel cuts but there's an issue with the size of that gap. When I rip or cross cut plywoods because of the direction of the blade, I can get tear out. And if I have a little strip of wood left over when I make a cut, it could get sucked down beside the blade. So what I like to do to solve both of those problems is use this zero clearance insert. You buy this as an aftermarket insert, drops in the same way as the other one, has leveling screws, and now the blade is right next to the insert. So that prevents tear out and little pieces can't slide through. If I need to replace the insert because of a change of saw blade kerf or even for a dado, I take out the old one, slide in a new one, drop the saw blade down, set the insert in, and then slide my fence over, being sure that it's not going to be over where the blade's going to come up, start up the saw, and slowly crank it through the insert and I'll have a brand new sacrificial strip. Now one more thing about the saw blade. When it's attached to the arbor, there's a washer and a nut. The washer that comes with the saw is this one, pretty small. It does give some support to the blade, but more and more we see these stabilizers. And this is much bigger and heavier. This one has a O-ring on it, goes up against the blade, gives it a lot of support, and it stops vibration, giving me much cleaner cuts. The best thing you can do for your table saw is keep the top clean. I want it as slick as possible, smooth and slick. I want the wood to easily slide over it and not hang up. If 
But as with any horizontal surface, there's always a temptation for people to put drinks or their coffee cup or even lunch on top of the table. And around this workshop, if that happens, they are severely reprimanded and they don't do it again. However, every once in a while, there's a need for some serious maintenance. So here I've sprayed on a lightweight penetrating oil and I'm using one of these nylon pads. Everybody has these under their kitchen sink for cleaning pans and just work it in until all that rust is loosened up. Now with the rust beaten back, I'm applying a household cleaner, just a detergent, to remove any oil that might be remaining. And now for the wax. This is just a standard flooring wax, hardwood flooring wax. It has no silicone in it, because that could affect the wood when I go to finish my piece. Lay it on, let it dry, and buff it out. Three coats should do the job. All right, no more rust. Boy, that is nice and slick. Now, not only do I do the cast iron, but I do the insert, the wings, and the fence. Any place that wood is going to come in contact with it. I want it slick. Let's talk about adjustments to the table saw. There are not many, but they're important. Kickback is a major concern, particularly when ripping boards. And here's what happens. As the board is going through, somehow it gets pinched up against the blade on either side. And because the blade is turning at high speed, it grabs onto the board, launches it out the back of the saw. If it doesn't hit the operator, it could hit a piece of furniture. Or if there's a window back there, it would go right through. I'm going to check some things to make sure that I don't get kickback. First, I want to check that the blade is parallel to the miter slots. So I crank it all the way up, take a good combination square. Bring it to the miter slot and slide it against the side. While holding it tight to the side, bring the blade to the carbide tooth, lock it down, then slide to the front edge and check the blade there, making sure I'm tight against the miter slot. And that is perfectly aligned. So we know that the blade is parallel to the miter slots. Now I want to check that the fence is parallel to the miter slots. Again, using the combination square, slide it up against the fence, lock it down. It's nice and snug. Move it to the front edge and check it here. Now that has a very tiny gap. It's only about a 64th of an inch, but that's enough to cause trouble. So I'm going to make an adjustment. I'm going to pop the fence out. And there's a set screw right here that pushes on the nylon slide on the other side of the saw. I'm going to put my Allen wrench in and just run it that way a little bit more. That'll push the front edge out just a little bit. It's not going to take much. All right, let's check our adjustment. Take the combination square, reset it. It's nice and snug. Bring it to the front. I'm tight to the miter slot, and that gap is gone. So we're in good shape now. Now one more adjustment. I do have this indicator that gives me the bevel set of the blade, and when it's on zero and bottomed out, it should be 90 degrees to the table surface. So I take my combination square, slide it up against the blade, and that looks pretty good. Let's talk about safety. The first safety rule is to wear these, safety glasses. No excuse for not having these. Secondly, the right clothing. This is ideal a short sleeve shirt. If I happen to be wearing a long sleeve shirt, I want to roll it up and tuck it in so that it can't come unrolled. No jewelry of any kind to catch on any of the tools. I also want to be alert when I'm working at the table saw. I don't want to be tired and distracted. It's a good idea to educate friends and family not to come running into the shop unexpectedly. Tell them to wait till the saw shuts down and then come into the shop. I want to know where I stand. I don't want to be behind the blade. If a piece should kick back, I want to be out of the way. I generally stand to the left because I'm right-handed. I want to know where my hands are and fingers. Keep them clear of the blade at all times. And I want to know where the off switch is. One of the most discussed devices on the table saw is the blade guard. 
Many woodworkers that we know simply remove them. They feel a lot safer knowing exactly where the wood meets the blade. Manufacturers, on the other hand, insist that we use blade guards. However, there are several operations that you can't have the guard in place for. For instance, datoing, making grooves, or using a tenoning jig. Here in the workshop, we don't use a guard for photographic clarity. Our advice is, when you get your saw, try out the guard that comes with it. If you can work with it, great. It's an individual decision. Now this is one of the most valuable accessories you can make for your table saw, and it's the cheapest. It's called a push stick, and it's an indispensable tool when I rip narrow pieces. I keep it nearby at all times, and if I'm ripping a narrow strip like this, about two inches wide, I start the piece first, reach over, grab the stick, hook it on the back edge, and guide the piece through. Now it also comes in handy as a way to hold my saw blade when I want to take the nut off. It's wood, it's not going to damage the carbide teeth. It's also useful to make a few small ones. This is a manufactured one. You could also make it out of plywood for narrower strips. Now let's talk about working with sheet goods like plywood and particle board. I build a lot of projects using those materials and I often work alone in the shop, so I need a couple helpers. First, I have this table. It's our assembly table, but it's built at the same elevation as the top of the table saw, so it becomes a nice staging tool. Now, as I handle the sheet, my right hand is going to guide the piece through, pushing, pulling, and pushing. My left hand is going to push it up against the fence. Now, you might think that I would be looking at the saw blade as I push the piece through, but that's not the case. I'm looking right here. I want to make sure that this edge of the plywood is tight up against the fence. If it starts to guide away, I'll adjust and make sure it's tight through the whole rip. The height of the blade needs to be no more than the thickness of the plywood, or just slightly above it, so that's good right there. Let's rip a piece. Okay, nice and straight. Now here's the other key, the outfeed table. You'll note that the piece is standing there by itself. If I push it just a few more inches, it's going to fall off the edge. It's just the right length. It takes no more room out of the shop than need be, yet it supports the plywood or the particle board when I push it through. Okay, now the outfeed table that's installed on our shop saw was a commercially made version, but it's very easy to make a homemade one. So tomorrow, we'll make an outfeed for the hybrid saw. Well, here's the beginning of that outfeed table. It's flipped upside down. I'm starting to make a frame first out of three-quarter inch plywood, which will get screwed together. And then that whole assembly will get attached to the surface, which is melamine. It's a particle board core with a laminate applied on each side. It's nice and slick. It's perfect for a table like this. Now I'm attaching the frame to the substrate with some two-inch screws, which will be just long enough to bite into the melamine but not go through. I'll put a screw about every six inches. Here I've cut some pieces out of scrap plywood to make some braces, which I'm gluing and screwing to the frame, and they'll help support the legs. Here I have a couple pieces of laminated veneer lumber that I've cut up to make the legs. It comes as large beams at the home center of the lumber yard. These are scraps I had left over from a framing project. I like it because it's nice and sturdy and it stays straight. I'm now drilling a 3 8 inch hole that's centered on the bottom to receive the leveling foot, the threads of the leveling foot, and this T-nut. All right, and I just take the T-nut and tap that into place.
out here I'm just rounding over the corners of the legs with a quarter inch radius. Now some glue and some screws to secure the legs and that should be plenty stiff. There will be a detail sheet on this that will come with the video and you'll hear more about that before the program ends. Now to dress up the edges of the melamine I'm using some quarter inch strips of oak attaching them with some glue and some pin nails. Take a look at our outfeed table. You'll note that there are a couple slots cut in the surface and that's to accommodate the miter gauge so it can pass by the front edge of the blade. There's a longer one on this side and that's for some other fixtures. There's also a cutout for the saw guard. Here I've laid out the slots necessary for this outfeed table. I've installed a straight edge and I'm going to use my router with a straight cutting bit to route it out. Now I'll move my straight edge over, make another pass and a few more until all the material is removed. On our hybrid saw, we have this angle iron on the back edge, and it's part of the side table and fence system, and it's going to come in real handy because it's going to support our outfeed table. If you didn't have this, you could buy a piece of standard angle iron and bolt it to the saw. Now the table, I want to have easily removable, so we're going to secure it to that angle iron with a couple of these. These are metal dowels. Half of the dowel is a, is a lag screw thread, the rest of it is a 3 8 bolt thread. The key is to drill the hole nice and parallel in the plywood, or square. I'm going to use a 3 8 inch bit and a scrap of wood to line it up. Now we'll just thread it into that hole using a pair of gripping pliers. Now for the hole in the angle iron, I'm using a 7 16 inch diameter bit. I want a little place so it'll be easier to put the outfeed table on and off. Okay, let's see if it fits. Right up with my edge. Good, now let's secure it. These wing nuts will make it real easy to remove the table when necessary. Now let's put a straight edge on the saw table and see how the outfeed is out. Well, you can see it's down too low, so I gotta bring that up, lift on it, and screw down the leveling foot till it's all nice and even. Okay, that's perfect. Now let's check the other side. All right, well, we're ready for a test drive. Perfect, all the way through the saw, and it didn't fall off the edge. This is going to come in handy. I thought I'd get started today by showing you a project that I recently completed. It's a replica of a Thomas Molesworth piece. We refer to it as cowboy furniture. And during the construction of it, I used a lot of the joints that we're going to demonstrate today on the table saw. For instance, if I swing it around, and you look at the back edge of this side panel, you can see that I made a rabbit to receive the plywood back so that the edge wouldn't show through. Swinging it back around to the front, if you look at the inside of the door, I also made a rabbet around the inside of the door to receive this panel so that it would be removable. On the case itself, this fixed shelf fits into a dado that's in this partition. There's also a dado in the bottom shelf to receive the partition itself. If we look at the drawers, you see that where the side meets the front, there's a rabbit, there's a dado where the back meets the side, and all four pieces have a groove to receive the plywood bottom. Also, the drawer is supported by some pieces of plywood that are connected together using a groove and a tenon. 
I can tell you this, almost all the pieces of furniture we build here incorporate one or more of those joints. Now, of course, I could use a router to do a lot of the rabbiting joints with a rabbiting bit, or I could use a straight cutting bit and a straight edge to form dados in different applications. But nine times out of 10, I'm going to use my table saw. And here's one simple example. Here's a piece of plywood with a groove down the middle. You might make a groove like this if you wanted to have a tongue and groove system coming together. Using just a single saw blade, I can get that groove perfectly centered. Here I've set the fence to a quarter inch away from the blade. If I run the piece through on one edge, and rather than moving the fence to widen it, spin it around and run it through again, I end up with a groove that's perfectly centered. Now before I demonstrate that, let's talk about shop safety. Be sure to read, understand, and follow all the safety rules that come with your power tools. Knowing how to use your power tools properly will greatly reduce the risk of personal injury. And remember this, there is no more important safety rule than to wear these safety glasses. It's easy as that, a perfectly centered groove. Now I could make grooves of different widths by simply moving the fence still turning it end for end until I got to the width that I wanted. That's the simplest way. Now for real wide grooves, there's another method. Years ago, we made dados with a device like this. It's a wobble dado. They're still available. It's two blades. It has a dial, so I can dial the width from quarter inch all the way up to 13 sixteenths. And you can see what it does. It wedges the blade open. A more costly alternative, but one that gives me superior results, is known as a stacked dado. This is an 8-inch diameter dado. It comes with two saw blades with carbide tips. There's a left and a right. If I use just one, I get a 1 8 inch groove. If I put two together, I get a quarter inch. Then I have a series of chippers. The chippers have four carbide tips. And this is an eighth inch. There's four one-eighth inch chippers. So if I combine the two blades and the four chippers, I get three quarters of an inch. However, today's plywood runs a bit under three quarters of an inch. So now they supply this one. It's a little bit thinner. It's 330 seconds. So by eliminating one of the one-eighth inch chippers, I get a 2330 seconds wide groove. Perfect for today's plywood. I also have a one-sixteenth inch thick chipper for other measurements. Then a series of shims, which slide on the shaft between the chippers or the blade, and I can fine tune it to thousandths of an inch. Let's set it up. Now when I install the dado, I want to make sure the teeth are going in the right direction. That would be towards me. And I want to make sure that the carbide tips are not against one another. That'll alter the width of the dado. So we'll tighten it up, plug it back in, and test it. Okay, nice clean cut, no chip out, the bottom is perfectly flat, and it should fit 23, 30 seconds just right. That's good. Let's talk about rabbits. The definition of a rabbit is a two-sided groove cut in the edge or the end of a board. I can make a rabbit on the table saw using the dado, but look what happens when I slide my fence over to align with the rabbit made in this piece. I'm hitting it. I don't want to cut in to my fence. I'm going to damage that. So the way around that is to install a sacrificial fence. And here's one that we've had for years. It's a piece of plywood covered with high pressure laminate, which is very slick, so the material will slide by easily. And you can see how much of it's been sacrificed. On the other side, there's a heavy duty angle and a couple clamping devices that allow me to secure it to the rip fence. And once it's in place, I can then slide it over to align the rabbit. Part of the dado goes under it, under the sacrificial strip, and not against my fence. Let's run a piece. After studying commercial versions of the sacrificial fence, I've come up with my own design, and I think there are some improvements that I've made. I'm starting by using this 
pre-finished plywood. It has a nice slick surface so the material will move over it easily and it holds screws well. This will be the sacrificial fence. I'm going to clip back the corners but I wanted it to be higher so I could accommodate clamping on a featherboard need in, needed in certain applications. On the back side I've made a shallow groove. This piece will go here. It sits over my fence. That'll get attached with glue and screws. And then this piece will get glued and screwed and that will help secure it to the fence. By clipping off the corners of the high fence, it saves me some weight and I won't have sharp edges to bump into. Now I'll wipe off the excess glue and screw it together. These T-nuts and these knobs will help secure the jig to the fence. The screws will hold the piece together, but I think I'm going to install some braces to keep it square. Taking the trouble to keep these pieces square to one another will improve the quality of the joints that I make with it. Here I've just drilled a hole for a dowel which is going to locate the jig on the fence. Obviously, if you don't have the same fence that we have here in the workshop, you'll have to engineer some changes to your sacrificial fence. Here's how it works. I drop it way forward of the fence, pull it back until the dowel stops it. Then I take my combination square and as I tighten down the knobs, I make sure that the jig is square to the table. Both ends and in the middle. That's good. So let's make the first sacrificial cut. I'm going to slide it over the data, which has been recessed all the way down into the table, about a quarter of an inch. We'll start it up and raise the blade. That's it, ready to use. Now let's build a featherboard. Well, here's my formula for a featherboard. We have a half a dozen of them here in the shop. It's a one by six. It can be different lengths. I cut the end at 30 degrees, and then I lay out the fingers, one quarter inch on center and five inches long. Here I've installed a couple permanent clamps on my sacrificial fence and that will allow me to clamp a featherboard in place when necessary without any portable clamps. And since they're secure, they're not going to loosen up and fall into the blade. Well, let's test drive our new sacrificial fence. Let's say we want to make a half inch by half inch rabbit along the edge of this piece of poplar. First thing I'm going to do is set the height of the blade. I'm just going to use this gauge and what I'll do is bring the blade up to it and then let it down until the gauge is right flush with the table, right there at the high point of the arc. Now I'm going to slide my fence over and set the width of the rabbit, just using my rule, sighting down to the edge of the outside of the dado, right there. And then we'll make a little test sample. Check my measurements. The depth is good that way. And we're good that way. So now I'm going to install my featherboard to make sure that the stock stays tight to the table as I push it through. Put it right down on top of the stock, lock it down, and now we can run our piece through. Works great. Another operation that we can do at the table saw is make miters, and for that I need a miter gauge. If the tool is perfectly adjusted, I'll get perfect miters. Now this one is the one that came with the saw right out of the box, and it's pretty good, and I'll show you how I tested it. First, I just took a piece of scrap wood and made a 90 degree cut.
and I take my best combination square and check it to see if there's any gap, and there's absolutely none, so it's perfectly square. Now I want to check 45, so I loosen it up, swing it over to 45, lock it in, tighten it down, and make a cut. Check it again with my square. And again, no gap, so that's a nice 45 degree angle. If there's any drawback to the factory made miter gauge, it's that it's very narrow. That can be lengthened, however, because they leave a couple holes for screws and I could take a nice straight edge and attach that. But what I prefer to use is an aftermarket miter gauge, like this one. It has a lot of nice features. Slide it into the miter slot. And one of the things that it can do is it can adjust right up to the blade so I get full support of my piece as it passes by the blade. Another feature is the adjustments. They're detents to lock in at zero and several other angles. But also when I want an odd angle like say 21 degrees, I just line it up with the front edge right here and lock it down. It has a stop so I can cut pieces the same length and it also has an extension that allows me to go out almost 36 inches from the saw blade. So let's test it out and make a simple frame. And that will tell us if the gauge is accurately adjusted. So what I'm going to do is swing it over to 45 degrees in this direction and cut one end of four pieces. In order for this frame to be perfectly square, all four pieces have to be the same length. So what I'm going to do is set my stop right there, and we'll run the other end. And now all the pieces are the same length. Let's bring them together. They all seem good. So our gauge is adjusted correctly. Another thing we can do with the table saw is cross cut wide panels, but not with the standard miter gauge. Here's why. I have to pull it back to get the big panel behind the saw blade, and it's not very sturdy. It's a very short fence. Even if I put an extension on it, how do I hold the panel and the miter gauge and push it through? It's not very accurate, and it's certainly not safe. Of course, I could use a straight edge and my circular saw, but there's a better way, and that's to use one of these. It's a sled or a panel cutter. It has this hardwood runner that rides in the slot without any play, a nice sized piece of plywood with a stop on the back, and it's cut so that it's right up against the edge of the saw blade. So let's say I want to cut a piece of this beadboard, nice and square. First, I'm going to square up one end. I've set the blade just slightly higher than I need, and I'll run one edge through. Okay, that edge is nice and square, so I'm going to turn it around and set it for length. So let's say I want to cut 28 inches. I'm not marking the front end, which is going to hit the saw first. I'm marking this edge because the sled is even with the saw blade. So if I slide the mark to the edge of the stop, it's going to cut exactly in that location. So now the piece is exactly the length I want, and if I put a framing square on it, you can see that that is perfectly square. Now it's a cinch to build one of these sleds, but every saw is different, so let's build one for this saw. Here's the stock I need to make the cross-cutting sled. This is the runner, a piece of oak. I want hardwood for the runner so it does not wear out too quickly. It's sized so that it slides easily without any play, 
and it's just slightly below the top surface of the table. Here's the panel or the base, a piece of half inch birch plywood. And I sized mine to be about 21 by 32, but that can vary according to your own preference. And this piece of oak, which is inch and a half wide, will become the stop on the back edge. Now the first thing I want to do is attach the runner, but first I measure to the saw blade and the miter slot, a little less than four and a quarter inches. So I'm going to put a mark on the bottom of my piano at five, five inches, and locate the runner away from that. I've drawn a line square across the base, and my hardwood runner is centered on the width of the base. I'm going to pre-drill for some three-quarter inch screws. Now I want to trim off the excess plywood. Now I'm ready for the stop. And theoretically, if I hold it flush with the back edge, it should be square to the cut, but never hurts to double check. I'm going to take my framing square, butt it up tight against the cut and against the stop. I'll secure it with a couple brads and then permanently with some screws. All right, with the stop attached, you can trim it off. And now we'll give it a test drive. Now the best way to check the accuracy is to take the edge that I just cut, flip the piece over, put it up against the stop, and see if it's flush with the edge of the piano. And it is, so that is perfect. Recently I completed this piece. It's a painted cabinet, and this is the top section. One of the nice features is this arched door. The elements of the door are joined together with mortise and tenon joinery. Now here's a typical mortise and tenon joint. The mortise is cut in one piece, I do that first, and then I fit the tenon to the mortise. It's pretty easy to make the tenons over on the table saw. Here's the setup. I need a miter gauge. I've set my saw, in this case, to about a quarter of an inch above the table. And the first thing I want to do is make shoulder cuts. That's this cut the one on the other side, and on each edge. To control the length of the tenon, I'm going to use my rip fence, but I don't want to guide the piece using the rip fence because that would risk kickback. What I want to do is use a stop block. Here's a commercially made one. It tightens down over the fence, and I set it in front of the blade. I engage the piece to the stop block, then I push it through the saw. It's clear. There's no chance of kickback. And if I hold it firmly to the miter gauge, it's not going to move. All the cuts will be accurate. And you can see how it's going to be consistent all the way around. Now, you can make a homemade version with a couple pieces of plywood screwed together, another T-nut, and a five-star knob. Same thing, just drops over the fence and it locks in place. Okay, now I have a shoulder cut all the way around. On the narrow end, I want to nibble away the material. I'm going to leave the stop block in place because I don't want to exceed the length of the tenon. Now before I change any of the setup, I want to make sure I've made the shoulder cuts for all the tenons I need. The next operation is to make the cheek cut, and that controls the thickness of the tenon. To do that, I'm going to use a tenoning jig, and don't even think about building one of these. They are a bargain. They've always been a bargain, and they're very accurate. Let me tell you how it works. I've got a bar that rides in the miter slot. There's a fence here that can be tipped, but now it's set at a perfect 90 degree angle to the table. On this side, I can make micro adjustments to control the thickness of the tenon and lock that in place. There's a back strip. Most importantly, there is this clamping device that helps me hold the piece securely while I push it through. Now to set the height, all I do is take my sample, it already has the shoulders, and raise the blade just up to that shoulder mark. And then I clamp the piece in, run one side of the cheek cut, turn it around, and run the other side.
That's all there is to it. You've just seen me make a bevel cut on our saw, which is known as a right tilt, which means the blade tilts to the right from the operator's perspective. At the time the saw was made, it was pretty much the standard. Now, when cutting veneers, there's an issue. Number one, my finished face is down on the table. It could get scratched. Number two, as I push it through the blade, because of the direction of the blade, the way it's turning, I could get some tear out on my finished edge. And that's a pretty good cut, but it's not perfect. But most importantly, when I go to bevel the other edge, that bevel that I've already made can slip under the fence and cause some kickback. Now at the time there was no choice, but today most manufacturers are making their saws with left tilt. And there's some advantages, particularly when working with these veneers. Now when I make the initial bevel, my finished face is up, no chance of it getting damaged. And because of the direction of the blade, I'm going to get a cleaner cut with no tear out. But most importantly, when I go to bevel the other edge, the bevel I've already cut is high up on the fence. It can't slip out, so it's going to be safer. Whether it's left or right tilt, it's a personal preference. Well, that was a lot of fun doing that two-parter on the table saw. It's the most indispensable tool that I have here in the workshop. And it's easy to make accessories to extend the usefulness of your table saw. Now, let me show you what we're going to build next time. We call it the Taunton chest. It looks like a chest but these two draw fronts are actually simulated because behind it is an open cavity. The only draw that operates is this one down here, right on the bottom. Now this wonderful decorative painting was done by Natalie Gardner, a decorative artist who we've worked with before. A chest just like this one that was built in 1709 sold for nearly $3 million earlier this year, so we just had to build one. That'll be next time right here in the New Yankee Workshop.